EM Weekly is starting right now. If parents don't go back to work, the community is not going to recover post-disaster. That, right. That's the reality of it, right? Businesses can't get back to work if the employees can't have a place, a safe place to drop their kids off. Breaking news. Two items that we're going to talk about today are the Hurricane Maria and the earthquake of Mexico City that happened yesterday. Yesterday was the 32nd anniversary of the 1985 earthquake, and to the day they had another 7.1 earthquake that had hit it. The 1985 earthquake was at 8.5. Hurricane Maria was the latest storm to swing in from the Atlantic, and it continues its destructive path across the Caribbean, with the possibility remaining that it could make landfall on mainland U.S. So far, nine deaths from the storm have been confirmed. Two on the French island of Guadalupe, which was hit hard, and earlier the small island of Dominica, which was slammed, with the Prime Minister saying that the nation was devastated. Early on Wednesday, officials stated at least seven people were killed there. So right now, the storm is over Puerto Rico. It hit some small islands um, outside the larger island of, of Puerto Rico, and uh, right now it's over San Juan, moving around 10 miles an hour. So Maria, which has been, was made from a Category 1 to a Category 5 in about 24 hours, um, made landfall with around Category 4 when it hit Puerto Rico, packing winds between 130 to 156 miles an hour. By measure of pressure, this is the third strongest storm to make landfall in the United States, according to officials quoted by the Associated Press. The lower the central pressure of storm, the stronger it is. Maria's pressure was about 917 millibars, which is lower than Irma's U.S. landfall of 929 millibars in the Florida Keys. And Hurricane Katrina's landfall in 2000 is 920. Uh, So Puerto Rico had long been spared from the direct hit by hurricanes with the last category four storm occurring in 1932. The strongest storm ever to hit the island was San Felipe in 1928 with winds of 160 miles per hour. Where was the storm before Puerto Rico? Well, Maria has taken some southerly route uh, than Irma. So first hitting Dominica and Guadalupe before moving toward Puerto Rico, which largely avoided the devastation by Irma. So I think that actually kind of made the people on the island a little, I don't know, less ready for this one to occur. I was talking to some people on the island the other day, and uh, when I was talking to them, they lost power. uh, And so they weren't able to continue the conversation. And so this was two days before the storm actually hit. Puerto Rico is known for not having some great power grid anyway, and this is really going to, the storm's really going to devastate them when it hits. So according to the National Hurricane Center, Maria is expected to continue on a northwest track, moving along the northeastern coast of the Dominican Republic on Thursday before striking the southern Bahamas earlier on Friday. And it's then predicted to swing north to the open Atlantic, moving between America East Coast and Bermuda. However, the long-term forecasts are less certain. Hurricane Irma swung to the west coast of Florida and have, haven't been predicted to hit the east coast. We're going to have some more storms hitting. And don't forget that there's a, also a tropical depression that's still off the coast of, of New England that's doing some damage up there as well. So that's on the storm front. More to come on that. So a magnitude 7.1 earthquake hit Rabaso, Mexico on Tuesday. This was felt all around southern Mexico or central Mexico. The powerful sh- uh, shocks were felt in Mexico City, damaging buildings and causing residents to panic, and more than 200 people have died. There are still c- buildings that are collapsed that they have to uh, get people out of, and so I'm expecting that death toll to rise. A powerful earthquake jolted Mexico City on Tuesday, causing buildings to collapse and sway. And that was coincidentally on the anniversary of the 1985 quake that did major damage to the capital. If you remember, 1985 was 8.0, and about uh, 10,000 um, Mexicans died that day. So in retro- retrospect, Mexico did a great job so far as far as doing building codes and, and, uh, and the uh, mitigation of things. So right now, the latest report is 217 people are dead, although I've heard conflicting reports on that as well. But this is the one that this is the official report. That's what we're going to go with. So according to the National Coordinator for Civil Protection, uh, Luis Felipe Puente, this includes that at least 20 children who were found dead at Enrique Rabison School in Mexico City's southern Copa District that collapsed. More than 3,400 soldiers are being deployed to the areas affected by the earthquake. Panicked office workers streamed into the streets as the quake toppled buildings and sent police. 
plumes of dust in the air. So according to Mexico Seismology Center, the epicenter was between the states of Puebla and Morales, about 75 miles south of Mexico City. Mexico City's mayor said there were reports of people trapped in collapsed buildings after the quake, though the number was unclear. About 44 buildings were severely damaged or destroyed, according to Rutgers. So the U.S. Geology Survey said that the quake was a magnitude 7.1 and estimate facilities in the hundreds. The economic loss will be in the hundreds of billions of dollars. The quake was at a known tectonic fault, not on the edge of the two moving plates like many a strong earthquakes. A U.S. geology survey seismologist Paul Earle told Associated Press that there have been 19 earthquakes of magnitude 6.5 or larger within 155 miles of Tuesday's quake in the past century. Earle said that this uh, earth is usually about 15 to 20 quakes that size for uh, each year or longer. That's the report right now for Mexico. More news is coming in and our thoughts and prayers are with the people of Mexico City and with the people of Puerto Rico. We're talking with Joel Wine down in Florida. His house and neighborhood were impacted by the storms by Irma. So, Joel, welcome to EM Weekly. How are you doing, man? Hey, great to talk with you, Todd. Always a pleasure. Um, we're, we're okay. You know, the, the big thing down here is, is that we got smacked pretty good. But I think that in the big picture of things, the people who are able to complain about having to clean up the debris and the garbage and all that stuff should be pretty thankful that they're there to complain about it because this was big. This was big. You've been through a few of these storms before in the past. What was it like when this when Irma decided to hit landfall in Florida? I think that Irma was a little bit different than some of the other storms I've been through. I'm a native Floridian, lived here pretty much most of my life, except for time I spent in service, time in college and all like that. But anyway, as the storm came, it slowly built, and it went from almost – just a, a windy, uh, misty shears until to an abrupt, literally, pounding of the wind, as if the wind was punching the house. Mm. I mean, you could really feel it. You could feel it, hear it. It was echoing in the way that was, as well as the rain. The rain seemed to be coming from every possible direction. It was, it was intense in that way, no doubt. So Florida was evacuated and you decided to stay. What made you uh, decide to stay uh, and ride out the storm? In Florida, there's really no place to run. We knew that the path was going to, or the path of the storm was going to go north. We're in South Florida, so we certainly aren't going to the Keys. East and west, there's no place to run because there's, there's no place to go. And because directly to the west of where I live are the Everglades. So that's an out. That's no place to go. Um, to the east is the ocean, and that's just a few miles away anyway. So there's no real place to go. And going north, all you're doing is prolonging the inevitable of being hit by the hurricane. So it was for our, in our opinion, it was best to just bunker down as we always have. Our home was well built. It was built after um, Andrew, so it was up to code with that stuff. And we're used to it. We have a routine, so we just followed our protocol. Now, Andrew, when that came in, that pretty much just wiped out complete areas of, of Florida. Are you seeing the same effect with Irma here? I heard a stat today that something like 80% of all the homes in the Keys have some sort of damage, but it doesn't seem to be like that flattening that Andrew did. Is Am I reading this right, or is it is this, I'm not seeing the right reports? I think you've got that 100% right, from my opinion. Andrew was just flat out nasty as far as leveling stuff. But it also hit areas where there was no vegetation in a way to prevent winds from or to redirect winds away from homes or anything like that. And the homes were so, there were so many homes in such small areas that it just, as it mowed over one, it mowed over three, it mowed over five. Where we are, we tried to learn from that. And as we built this home, that we're in. We used a lot of landscaping to help deflect high winds or rain, just the way we landscaped to to help the survivability of our home. Been studying disasters for a long time and I noticed that we don't allow for the mangrove, the barrier islands, uh, that type of stuff to, to take the brunt of storms any longer. Matter of fact we're building on the barrier islands. I mean that's pretty much what the keys are, right? They're a bunch of barrier islands. Pretty much. So change gears a little bit here. What's this, the condition like uh, on the ground in your neighborhood? Um, I know you have electricity, but you're telling me that uh, that's rare down there. I, I know there's something like around four or five million people still left without electricity. What's it like in your town? There's a lot of places around us that are still 
getting power on. Power's up around us now, pretty much, but there's still a lot of places that you can hear the generators running. You know, we can hear that. But it's kind of interesting because you look around, it's a bright, clear, cloudless sky, beautiful blue sky. You see the neighbors chatting amongst each other. You see the kids playing and this and that. And as you pull back, as you widen your view from all those little things, you realize that all this is happening around mounds and piles of broken tree branches, (laughs) of garbage, of neighbors helping neighbors trying to sort out their yard and trying to uh, get things off of cars and things like, you know what I mean? So it's, it's kind of like a, a, a weird twist to, to life in the way of, of recovery, but it's as if, you know, we expect this, we live with South Floridians, we expect to be hit by hurricanes, we expect to recover from hurricanes, and this is what we're doing. One last question, and I know you're a trained first responder. I know that you told me that you actually went out and started helping people right away. What was the, what's the mood of the people um, as you were responding to their needs and what's their mood today now that they're in the recovery phase? It's kind of interesting. I set up a routine with my neighbor where we have walkie talkies and I see the hurricane as like a five phase kind of event. We know that first of all, it's building, it's coming. Then we get the initial hit of the first wave as it comes First phases, as the eye passes, everything calms, okay? You have that, that, that window of calmness to be able to go out, assess any damage, quick fix anything that you think could cause greater damage if it's not attended to immediately. But you don't want to spend a for, you know, a, a forever out there trying to make that work because quickly the eye will pass, which then the rest of the storm hits, and then the, the – Phase five, I call the recovery of, you know, going out and just uncovering the damage and, and doing all that. So while the aisle is passing, my neighbor and I, we decided, well, we'll, we'll chat on walkie-talkie when we feel that the eye is right for us, when we feel it, because you can definitely feel a difference when the eye is passing. We go out, assess our properties, see what we need to quick fix, work as a team simply because you don't want to go out by yourself ever to do any kind of anything. You should always have a partner no matter what. I mean, that's, that's 101 in um, recovery kind of mode or helping other people in any way. So once we were good, we did a quick survey of our neighborhood. We found that other neighbors were already trying to fix things and this and that. And as we saw more than two or three people working on one issue, we'd move on to something else. And we literally worked around our community. We have 34 homes in our community. And it was a quick assessment. We were able to solve a bunch of small problems, which we feel may have saved people money in the long run and helped them, you know, get debris away from their cars in case they could, they needed to or had to drive for an emergency scenario or whatever it might be. And it was really good. It worked out well for us in that way. And then once the storm was gone, Back on the walkies, you good, I'm good, all right, let's go do this. And we worked as a team to go out and just start, you know, uncovering our homes, uncovering paths for safe routing, either by walking or by, you know, driving. And uh, we were able to at least make some paths for people to get around safely. Well, that's great. Did you guys have any um, injuries uh, in your neighborhood? None that I'm aware of. That's, that's but awesome. The one thing that, yeah, but the one thing you definitely want to remind people is that it might look dorky or whatever to whomever, but I would never go outside without a helmet, safety glasses, gloves, and some kind of absolute fully covered footwear. I wear boots myself. I wear boots every day. So, you know, that kind of stuff, because where we live, we are literally um, maybe eight miles from the Everglades. So whatever inhabitants of the Everglades is is chased, is either runs from or is chased from the Everglades, it's going to wind up in our yard. So we're talking about alligators, uh, snakes, uh, could be any number of animals. And the last thing you want to do is find yourself either almost stepping on or just being attacked by a fearful 
animal who doesn't know quite what's going on. All right, Joel. I don't. I don't want to burn too much more time of your time. I know that you're you're down there in Florida and try, still trying to recover from this. Do you have anything that uh, you wanna you wanna close with? Thanks for the opportunity, and uh, we'll chat soon. Three fifteen and three fourteen. There is at least one person that's been shot. Somebody is still shooting inside. Four fifty three. I have a party shot here. I need rescue. Hi. Are you ready for the unthinkable? Call our friends at High Speed Tac Med. They provide custom emergency planning and training that saves lives. With years of experience in law enforcement, search and rescue, responding to, and managing large-scale incidents, HSTM will evaluate and prepare written plans, training sessions, drills, and debriefs, leaving you with the necessary tools and experience that can save lives. Call HSTM today to discuss your specific needs and the staff at High Speed Tac Med will help ensure that you're ready and are in complete compliance. Call High Speed Tac Med today at 805-419-0024. Again, that's 805-419-0024. The friendly staff at HSTM is standing by. Bring it out bodies now. Get someone to the back as soon as you can. Rescue personnel. I got at least three to seven hit. Today, we have with us Heather Beal, and she has a great product when it's basically getting in front of children and youth for emergency preparedness and disaster training. So, Heather, uh, welcome to EM Weekly, and tell me really quick a little bit about yourself and then how you guys started and how you guys started writing uh, your books for, for kids. Well, thanks, Todd, for having me. I appreciate it. I recently retired from the military after 23 years, uh, spent a lot of time uh, targeting bad guys. And interestingly enough, I had studied conflict resolution and did a lot of crisis management exercise planning while in. Over time, of course, uh, you meet the love of your life, you have children, and your perspective changes, and you worry a lot about what's going to happen to them, too. So I used my emergency management training and my ability to handle issues to try and take a look at how can I help prepare them for disaster. There are statistics out there that say anywhere from 33 to 35 hours a week, children under the age of five, 61% of them are in some sort of child care arrangement. So the odds of me uh -huh. being there if something bad happened are pretty low. So that doesn't help me sleep at night. So I thought, okay, what can I do <laughs> to fix that? I also uh, made the mistake of trying to tell my daughter, who was uh, four at the time, and you know, it was, uh, okay, it was, it was at night, it was dark, there was a rainstorm and a tornado watch. I tried to explain we might have to go to the basement. I failed miserably and frightened her. So I realized maybe there's a better way to do this. So I started taking a look at what was available, and there really isn't anything out there or very little out there for kids at this, the preschool or early elementary uh, age. We watch a lot of Daniel Tiger in this house with both of my kids. And Daniel Tiger's PBS's way of trying to introduce scary topics with song and talking through issues really struck a note with me. So I came up with this idea of starting to publish children's books to teach them what to do if before it happens. So maybe then it won't be as scary. Well, that's brilliant. I have uh, two kids myself, and I live in an area where we have earthquakes. And we did have uh, an earthquake um just recently, a couple of years ago, actually. And it was amazing to see my son react in a positive way when the earthquake was going on. And we had a, my daughter who was a little bit younger at the time, and he was actually pulled her under the coffee table uh, like he was trained in school. So, so training kids to, to not be afraid of these things is, is brilliant because he, he did a great job. And my daughter was okay, and you know, it was a little scary. It was it was a small earthquake, it was like a five point eight or something like that. But still, you know, the, it, because of the training that he got in school and the stuff that we talked about beforehand, he he wasn't even nervous about it. He just acted like he was supposed to. So I agree with you. Pre training the kids uh, is is really important. So tell me the topics that you have in your books, and how do you get those in front of the the, the children? Thanks, Pat. Uh, the first book I wrote was Elephant Wind. It's about tornadoes, and I know it sounds like an odd title, but try to explain what a funnel cloud is to a five-year-old. They don't know what a funnel <laughs> is, right? But they right. do know what an elephant trunk looks like. So we kind of took that approach to it. So the second book is called Tummy Rumble Quake, and like the name suggests, it's about earthquakes, and that one should be out any day now, so I'm really excited about that. 
So I've put it out. Uh, it's on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, all the major distributors. I'm also talking to child care organizations and emergency managers about trying to in- include these materials as part of their outreach programs to the community to get something out there for the younger kids. I think that's a great idea, um, something that I would like to use my, myself reaching out. I know that there was a program that was started by the National 911 System called Ready Fox 911 Program or something like that. I forget the exact title. Uh, but it's the same concept as what they did is they made it easy for kids to to know what 911 is and, and how it works and, and that type of stuff. So I could see your program being something along that line, like that, that type of program. Have you spoken to uh, any emergency managers or, or any uh, state or local groups to push this out? I have, actually. I've been uh, looking. I've been meeting up. Uh, I also run a nonprofit where I try and help prepare a child care for disaster. So over the years, I've been building up a, a connection, a network of folks in both the EM community and child care. And I've had some real positive feedback about the first book. I have an emergency manager in Florida who ordered like 500 copies of it to use as part of their outreach program. So the interest is there is just getting the word out that there is a product to meet that need. And that's where I'm I'm trying to focus my time now. That's exactly why I invite you to be on the show, because I think that as emergency managers, learning about products like this is, is key into helping our community get the word out and you know, programs like yours is, is really are really important. I'd like to talk to you a little bit about your other venture, your nonprofit that you were just talked about regarding getting pre-K schools trained in disaster response. How does that work? <laughs> That's a great question, and Todd. And the answer, unfortunately, right now is better in theory than actuality. It, it's a tough mm-hmm. nut to crack, crack and I'll, I'll tell you why. Um, there are some overarching guidance out there. Uh, to start with the National Commission for Children Disaster in 2010 made some recommendations about the state of child care preparedness and just preparedness of, of children in general. Save the Children does their annual report cards talking about whether states are, are meeting the different criteria for being ready. And the Child Care Development and Block Grant Act also provides some recommendations for emergency operations plan. Unfortunately, most of the child cares don't really understand what that means. And the ones that do get it, they still don't have the resources or the time to really operationalize it. They get the mm-hmm. training their state requires. It's usually a fill in the blank form. They post it, they've met their state requirement check. It's kind of scary. Right. I'm, I'm actually I'm very worried about their real ability to handle the issues when they happen. Fire drills, they got down. Childcare has been doing right. that for, for ages, right? <laughs> but a lot of these other scary things like post-disaster reunification with families, notification of families, K through 12, obviously, even at the private school level, there are, there are plans and set that talk about reunification and, and how we're going to do that. You know, my son goes to a private school, uh, and they have off-site reunification centers all set up and everything like that. And I, I don't know if it's because we're here in California or if it's just the school that he goes to is progressive that way. There's tons of, of daycare centers and Head Start programs all over the place, and I wonder about that too. As an emergency manager, what their responsibilities are because they're not, well, as far as I know, uh, they're not that regulated by the state and like a uh, private, or excuse me, like a public school is. And, you know, you see them all the time, like, ah, you know, now enrolling K through 12 at this, or K through 12, uh, now enrolling, you know, pre-K uh, here. Uh, and, and I look at those places, like, and I think that in the back of my mind is what is their plan to get these kids back? Because in California specifically, we're talking about the large scale earthquake and getting people to and from when the roads are clogged. If you think about the Midwest, like Amore, Oklahoma, where the entire city was just devastated and demolished, what are their plans to get people back with their children? Do you know this? You bring up a lot of great points, and I wish I could uh, give you a reassurance that, that they have a plan and they're, on, they're, they're working on it. But the reality is, is, is it's a lot of different issues. First, it's the, not just the accreditation, but the, the follow-up, the enforcement piece of it. For an example, I, one of the states I just lived in, uh, I went to the training that they give child care providers, the mandatory training on emergency management. And the lady told them all, yes, you're supposed to have three-day supplies on hand, but no one will ever check. Hmm. So, so there's that going out, which is, is kind of a problem, right? Each state doesn't have the resources to enforce and make sure they're really ready for the disaster. And it's incentives. The child care providers are doing this out of their own pocket. It's not a high-profit right. industry to start with. Employee turnover is horrific because 
they can't pay the employees what they want, but most of their costs are all in wages and salary. So mm-hmm. it, it's difficult. One of the things my nonprofits come up with is, is a certification program where it helps them operationalize the plan. Uh, in the military, uh, you've heard of recall drills, right? Yeah. You go down your list, you have to get a hold of all your people, call the boss, got it, I found everybody. That's right. kind of a foreign concept in, in child care. They have a list, everyone fills out their paperwork, you hope the parents update it. I, I've asked a couple of them, when's the last time you tried to contact all those numbers and see if they work? And, and I get blank looks, because the only time they make a phone call is something's wrong with the child. So right. in the event of something's wrong with the entire daycare, we just experienced an earthquake, whatever it is, they have no concept of how much time that's going to take, the issues how current that information is. And just even talking about that as a starting point, a lot of them realize the need to do it, but there's a lack of incentive to do it. They care about their children. They love they love the children. Don't I don't want to say they don't, but when it comes to being able to dedicate the resources and time to actually do all the prep, that's where it, it, there's a shortfall. Can cities regulate child care? I know they can regulate where child care goes, but can they regulate the what child care needs to have or is that just run specifically by by states or by Department of Education? Most of what my experience has been so far is there's one agency in the state, usually Department of Education, sometimes Health and Human Services, sometimes Family Services, in which child care is accredited. And reaccreditation or inspection criteria is set there. And in the state laws, usually there'll be something about... There is always, sorry, there is always something about child safety and regulations for family daycare versus center daycare, and they they look at the number, the capacity numbers, but the amount of detail on specifics for disaster preparedness, it's kind of an afterthought. Child safety is at the forefront, child safety and health, and disaster preparedness really isn't thought about as its own separate entity requiring additional resources and information. Huh. Yeah, I know that with my my daughter, she's we're required to send her like some food, like a, like a little 3D kit and like change of clothes and stuff like that. And we put it in a little bag that they put in their cubbies. And I don't know if that's mm-hmm. just, again, the school where we're at or if that's something that they're supposed to do. I mean, it seems like it should be something pretty easy that a city can, and I don't know what the legalities are, so I'm kind of talking out of turn here, but a city should be able to just say, hey, this is what our expectations are. Because as a city emergency manager, that's going to become our problem pretty quickly if we can't reunify those children with their family members in a Tommy manner because Red Cross is not going to take those kids and the county social services is going to, are going to be overwhelmed. So what do we do mm-hmm. with those children that aren't being sent back to, to home? I mean, what, what are the pre-K daycare centers responsibilities as far as reunification goes? And how long can they hold children until they can be reunified with their with their parents? That's a really kind of a perplexing question right there. And I tell you, honestly, Todd, if there was an easy answer, I, I would be post, posting that out to everybody. It is it is difficult. Um, let me try and answer some of your <laughs> questions in there. Um, as far as cities making the rules, I, I really can't speak to that specifically. But the thing to remember, though, too, is if cities can legislate like the states can for what they want the daycare to do, it still comes down to resources. If they can't mm-hmm. afford it, what's going to happen? You're going to charge the parents more. And the tuition I t- pay for both of my children rivals some community college semester cost, right? It's not right, cheap for right. the parents to put their kids there. So it's, unless there's resources going along with the requirement, it's still going to be done to the minimum level because they just simply can't afford it. An interesting thing, too, is with child care, I've had my daughter and my son was like, he's been every place my son has been, they, they've had a kitchen. They've cooked the meals. When I started with my daughter, we had daycares we were out where we had to bring our food. We've had days where we had to prepare our bottles. We couldn't even leave an extra can of formula there. So how right. were they prepared for a big disaster? You know, 120 some kids in which you had to bring your own food every day. Right. <laughs> it's difficult quick. <laughs> it does get difficult quick. Yeah. Well, hang on one second. Let's take a quick break here. And then uh, when we come back, I do have a question regarding Uh, levels of of daycare, and maybe you can help us out with that. Emergencies happen, whether they're related to medical emergencies, threats of physical violence, weather related, or other. One of the most difficult things during an emergency is to find help and quickly and efficiently communicate with all parties, regardless of whether you're an administrator, law enforcement, or the end user. With Titan HST, we help distort time 
by creating high-tech yet simple to use mobile-based applications that connect you with the people who can help you. At Titan HST, we believe in the power of people. Hi, this is Todd DeVoe from EM Weekly. If your company is in the emergency management and response space, EM Weekly is a place for you to advertise. Each week, we bring in experts in emergency management, response, and leadership from around the world, and they're here to share their best practices. Our listeners are eager to learn about new products and ideas, so this is the space for you. For more information, please contact Brian at brian at emweekly.com. And welcome back from the break. So before we went on break, kind of alluded to the fact of levels of daycare. And in my mind, I'm talking about, you know, pre-K, maybe, you know, three, four-year-old child already out of diapers, already off of formula and that type of stuff. But then you, you kind of mentioned about the formula issue and that kind of opened up another question for me. What age level are we talking about with these family care, daycare, pre-kindergarten programs? Well, I'd say it depends on the facility. Um, most of the places I've been uh, in, in the three different states and the ones I've talked with, it depends on the capacity of the organization, but a lot of them will take infants as young as six weeks, some eight weeks, some 11 weeks. Wow. Some won't take children until two years old. It depends. I mean, if it's a family-based, if it's inside a home, how, if it's a center, how large it is. And each state has different requirements, a, a ratio of uh, for every three infants, there's got to be one provider. For every mm-hmm. four to seven, depending on the state, maybe it's for every seven two-year-olds, there has to be a provider. Some states, it's 10. So the difference in what the requirements for how many staff they have to have on hand also will vary by state. So yeah, you're talking a wide range of kids. And an interesting thing people forget is that child care isn't just through you know newborn, if you will, up through five years old. A lot of them have before and after school programs too. Wow, this is a bigger issue than than I even <laughs> thought. You know, like when I invited you to come on, I'm like, oh, this is a pretty interesting issue. And now I'm sitting there thinking, wow, this is a huge issue. At the college where I work, we actually have a daycare center. You know, I was going to talk to them and have some questions for them, but now I have some really some <laughs> some tough questions to ask <laughs> those people. Great, yeah, they're going to love you for that one. <laughs> but uh, all about wow. getting the word out. <laughs> It really is. So, um, how long have you been? How long have you been working on this issue? I started getting interested and involved in this, uh, and started my um, blocks in uh, 2015. Okay, a couple so years. More than a few years. I've been speaking at some of the emergency management conferences, trying to get the word out. But like you said, if it was easy, it'd already be fixed. People acknowledge the problem, but there's not the funding. Unlike the the schools, they get state and federal funding. These are all mm-hmm. mostly for-profit organizations. And we even even talked about my other favorite topic, which is child care recovery and how that impacts community recovery. <laughs> yeah, let's talk about that. Wow. So, okay. Well, I guess, so I guess we're not going to, and obviously in this one single podcast, we're not going to be able to answer the questions all the way through, but we definitely are raising some, uh, some serious questions. And so for those of you that are out in the community are listening to this, I'd love to hear what your solutions are and, and start this conversation up. Uh, so you can go ahead and if you, you know, on the website, just, just send us a message and let us know what you guys are doing in your specific communities regarding those questions that, that we brought up with Heather. All right, Heather. So let's talk about your, um, your other, your other passion here that you just brought up and tell me, tell me a little bit about that program and, and what that means. So what I try to, I speak a lot about is child care recovery. Um, it, it's kind of, it's a kind of the forgotten infrastructure of community continuity. If you will, if parents don't go back to work, their community is not going to recover post-disaster. That, right. That's the reality of it, right? Businesses can't get back to work if the employees can't have a place, a safe place to drop their kids off. But the enabling right. mechanisms for that are almost non-existent. Hmm. Yeah, I know that we talked about during um, swine flu planning and whatnot that we're looking at a 40% reduction at a minimum on the work workplace. Um, that's not even if the person gets sick. That's also if the children get sick and a parent has to stay home or sometimes both if, if the parent is sick as well. So but Todd, I'll that tell is you from a, personal experience, they're going to just close the childcare. Even if some of the kids mm-hmm. are, are safe, they're not going to take any risks because it is such an incubator <laughs> of everything known to man. I know because I have two children, I've gotten almost all of it. It's on a normal <laughs> basis, let alone an, you know, a, a, a pandemic. 
Childcare is going to be closed. Schools are going to be closed. There's not going to be a place to take the kids. Right. Wow. So then what, what do you think a solution to that is? We've got to be able to find a way to better enable child care. And there's been some work done, and actually this is what my dissertation is going to focus on. After Superstorm Sandy, uh, New York and New Jersey, they had a, the, the Children and Youth Task Forces, and they shook loose some state money to help child care recover. Typically, child care doesn't get anything. As you know, they don't qualify for public assistance because they're for profit. But the right. reality is, if the child care is not open, like we talked about, that's a problem. But just even from a basic business economy perspective, Say they do open, but it takes a while for them to open. In the meantime, as a parent, I'm going to find a place to put my child. If it takes six months for my old child care to open, well, odds are I'm not going to take them back, not because I don't want to go back to people we know and we got to assume they're still there, but at that point, my child is in a, an attachment development issue stage in which continual disruptions are going to be very hard on him or her. So they're not going to want to uproot them and take them back. So they, once they lose the business, they may have lost it forever, and they got to try and get new business there. Right. Yeah. We actually had a conversation in episode just a couple uh, with Dr. Uh, Pagan regarding business continuity for small businesses, and we talked a little bit about the hair salon type thing, where if you're not open back in three days, you're going to lose your clients that way. And I can see the same thing happening with childcare issues that if you're not back up and running within a few days you're going to lose those clients as well. So not only is it just the the parent that has an issue, it's that small business. And since it is for profit, that small business is producing taxes for the city that they're in. And so then there's a ripple effect associated with that as well. So I can definitely see that there needs to be a constructive reunification or a, a recovery plan specific for, for childcare. So are you working on that issue with those small businesses as well? So I haven't been able to get as far into the business continuity piece as I want to yet. But one of the issues I have identified even early on, and I've talked to um, some of the FEMA folks at the different panels, a lot of things, times people don't think about childcare, and they think about it as a small business, but a lot of times they're renting a facility. So even the yeah. best business continuity plan is going to be constrained by the, the business continuity plans of that land, landowner, landlord, if you will that may not right. have a plan for getting back in place because they haven't thought about it yet. It's one of you know 400 properties that they own in the city. So who's engaging them? And I got a lot of blank looks and, oh, wow, you're right, kind of faces across from the panel because no one had really thought about that. We target small business owners, but we're not targeting the landlords, if you will, as well. So we've got to make a concerted effort to get them on board to help enable childcare and any other business reliance on their uh, graces, if you will. What was the attrition rate of, of child care after Sandy? So I haven't got the exact numbers, but I do know that 10,000 child care were impacted. So I haven't got the exact data on that. I'm trying to remember my statistics from Hurricane, uh, from Katrina, I think they said that in, in one of the counties, only 19% of the child care came back within the first year. Well, that's huge. That's a huge impact. Just, um, I mean, not just on the business side, but just on everything, because what do you do with your kids? I mean, how do you go back to work? And, and then what's the impact of, of those people that are staying away from work because they don't have childcare and they don't have that support structure and they don't have a quality childcare to go to? Um, what, what's the economic devastation that occurs to those local jurisdictions with people not going back to work? And what's the impact on those businesses of people not being able to go back to work uh, on them? Wow, that's, that's a huge, that's a ripple effect for sure just based upon childcare, huh? Absolutely. And one of my favorite quotes that I use often in my papers is, uh, and I can get to the source for it, is the second largest impediment to community recovery after lack of housing is lack of childcare. Wow. <laughs> you're opening, you're definitely opening my eyes to an issue that um, I, I haven't really studied and have only given cursory thought to. And this is really something that we probably should give a lot more than just, you know, kind of like, oh yeah, there's a problem. We'll talk about it later because that is a tough question right there. The harbinger of doom and gloom, but I, I'm not trying to do that. The point is getting the word out, getting people to realize it, because once they hear this, they're like, oh, my gosh, you're right. We really haven't. We've just been assuming things. It's all going to continue right. to flow. It, it's not. And if it doesn't, the impacts are just huge. And so we've got to come figure out a way to help enable child care survival so the community can recover. Okay. Well, so uh, based on that, what are – good next steps for people that are listening to this podcast and that really want to 
start reaching out to their child care uh, centers within their jurisdiction, what are the next steps? What can they do to help this problem out? So the first thing I recommend that we need to do is, is prepare the kids. Getting through the disaster is the first step. We can't protect them from everything. We can't you know, guarantee their safety, but we can arm them with enough to hopefully increase their odds. So that's the first thing, because the more prepared they are, the more child care is starting to think about this, and they can move on to some of these other business continuity kind of questions. But this has got to be the normal way we do business. We are going to create a generation of children that can handle issues and problems because that's just what they've been taught to do. Wow. That's a good first step right there. So if the first step is then to um, train the kids in disaster preparedness, what it is to be involved in a disaster or, or, and or an emergency, what's the second step then as far as getting reached out to the local businesses? Well, this, this, is, a, this is the harder part because, again, uh, what I've come, apart, come across when I've tried to talk to emergency management, local emergency management, is they get it, they think it's important, but they look at child care the same way that they do the nursing homes and say they've got to come up with a plan. They've got to figure it out because they just don't have the resources. Like here in Kitsap County, we have four emergency managers. That's it. So they don't have right. the extra people to do that dedicated outreach. And we're talking, you know, potentially thousands of child care, depending on, the, on the, that local area, because you have a lot of family base as well as some in church and the, the centers. So trying mm -hmm. to find a way to bridge that and get them involved and, and enable them, give them some resources and tools that they can use, because quite honestly, they're not going to, a lot of them either don't have the resources at the time or the expertise to develop a lot them themselves. One interesting thing I'll, so, I'll share on that same note is, I'm sorry, <laughs> just, just real quick. No, is no, I tried to speak to get trained, get certified to provide training to child care providers. But since I didn't have an early childhood education degree, I could not get certified in some states in a way that would give that child care provider their required CEUs for training. So emergency huh. management is being taught by other child care providers. I know we have a lot more to discuss on this, and, and we're coming close to the end of, of our of our time together. Let's put this on hold for a minute, and then I want to come back to you maybe um, in a couple of in a couple months here, and I want to see how we do. We'll re redo this conversation and see if we can get some movement with getting people to prepare those, those daycare centers and those child care centers. So. <laughs> Now, I'd love if to come people, back and discuss it more. <laughs> yeah. And so that being said, how do we get people that are listening to this podcast to get in contact with you regarding these issues? Because this is important, and I think you you just turned me into somebody who's going to start looking for some stuff and, and, and be an evangelist on, on this topic. How do we get people to get in contact with you uh, if they want to start reaching out to their programs and, and as emergency managers? How can we uh, get in touch with you to uh, get more information to share with our, our child care and daycare centers? Well, thanks. Ed. So there's two websites that uh, are, they can be used to contact me. Um, my nonprofit is called Blocks. It stands for Building Links Between Offices of Emergency Manager, Child Care, and the Community for Kids Safety. Uh, BlocksUSA.org is that URL. I can also be reached um, via the contact on trainforsafety.com, and that's the number four versus uh, the word F-O-R. Either one of those will get forwarded up to me. There's a wealth of information about child care preparedness on blocks, and there's information about our publications on the uh, Train for Safety side that are available to help prepare child care aged children about disaster. Awesome. And I'll put that information down in the show notes as well, everybody. So you know, if you didn't have a pencil with you, you can just look down and, and the links will be there so you can click onto them. And I have visited both websites, and they're really beautifully done, and there's a lot of great information on there. I'll be using that resource more. And one last question for you. Outside of the of your books for kids, what publication would you recommend to somebody who wants to learn more about um, this topic? Books out there about children and disaster, there's not a whole lot of them. There are a few books. Um, one that I've been reading actually is a summary of, of the conference called Preparedness, Response, and Recovery Considerations for Children and Families. It's a workshop summary looking specifically at how things went during Hurricane Sandy. And Managing Children in Disasters um, by Bullock, Haddo, and Coppola is also a good introduction to some of the basic issues that we need to think about. All right. Well, awesome. And thank you so much for the information that you shared with us today. And we'll definitely be talking to you more in the future uh, regarding this topic and, and more. Really good luck with your, your book sales, and 
Again, we'll put all that information down in the show notes. Everybody else out there, thank you for listening to this podcast. And again, reach out to Heather if you have any questions. If you have any questions for me, you can always reach me at asktodd at, at ianweekly.com. And also look down at your iTunes. If you, if you can give us a positive feedback on iTunes, that would be great as well. So again, thank you for listening to Ian Weekly.